Travel expenses paid for in part by MSI. New from MSI, the Infinite A Gaming Desktop, featuring all standard components, ATX motherboard, twin Frozer 2 graphics card, and a tempered glass side panel. You can now pick up an MSI pre-built ATX Gaming Desktop, built from standard components. Learn more at the link in the description. Travel expenses also paid in part by Fractal Design. Just launched from Fractal, the new Celsius with extreme and quiet all-in-one water cooling. For true enthusiasts, the satisfaction of a clean and efficient build can never be overstated, and the Celsius makes this easier than ever with integrated fan hub and concealed cable routing. All modern CPUs are supported. Computex is over, and Intel is back. King of the hill, baby. Best single thread performance? Oh, you know it. Most cores on the CPU, you better believe it, beating them by two. <laughs> second, second best value per dollar? Uh, uh, sec second best uh, PCI Express lanes? Who cares about 20 <laughs> PCI Express lanes? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> So if you've been living under a rock, Computex was last week. I was there, I saw all kinds of cool stuff and we're gonna talk all about that. But Intel has launched a new CPU, a new CPU socket, a new chipset. Um, it is the next generation, uh, you know, past X99. Intel is calling it X299. And they've got a whole bunch of new CPUs to go with it. Unlike traditionally where they normally launch, you know, about four CPUs with a new platform, this time they're launching seven. Yes, so they've got the Skylake X, and that that's the headline. You know, that's that's on the marquee. High-end desktop, HEDT. 18 cores. <laughs> Woo! 18 cores. How many does AMD have? 16. We that's, turned it up to 11. That's two more. <laughs> so that's the headline. But Skylake X is not the only thing they're launching. They're also relaunching KB Lake, which yeah, uh, that's, that's the way that you can say that. And it's it's confusing because these chips are not much different. I mean, they can't take advantage of all these PCI Express lanes and they have the old way of caching things instead of the new way. And so why? The big mystery is why KB Lake? Why launch two kinds of chips and why launch them when they don't really bring much to the table? Yeah, so X299 is a new socket, socket 2066. 20 XT6, no, it's 20, socket 2066. It's designed for up to 44 PCI Express lanes and quad channel memory. And so this is the first time that Intel's launching two different types of CPU for the same socket. So the, the new KB Lake X chips, as they're called, will not actually give you any more than 16 PCI Express lanes, the same as you have on Z270. And it will not give you any more than dual channel memory, the same as you have on Z270. So a lot of people are like, wait, so we're having a four core, four thread, an i5, and a four core, eight thread, a very, the lowest end i7, on this new high-end desktop socket platform? No one can figure it out. We well, have. So to answer this question, we have to go back in time a little bit. With the introduction of Ryzen, Intel had one thing going for it. It had single clock performance. Yeah. Whatever AMD did, they could not dethrone Intel on single clock performance. You want those high FPS games, eSport, MLG Pro? That was Intel's world. And so that we think is the explanation of why you would do this KB Lake X nonsense. Yeah, so Skylake, if you remember, Skylake came first and then there was KB Lake and that was on the, you know, like the mainstream platform, not the high-end enthusiast platform. And we think that Intel was not super confident in their ability to produce a high core count CPU, Skylake X in other words, that would also clock as good or better than KB Lake. You throw in the variable of Intel saying that they're rebalancing their cache architecture for Skylake X, which gives each core more cache at the cost of lowering the shared L3 cache pool size, which is something that helps single thread performance in my own testing. Um, you may end up in a situation where the six, eight, 10 core parts, uh, single thread actually perform worse, maybe even worse than X99. So you gotta make up for that in clock speed. So Intel wanting to hedge their bets is also launching KB Lake X for socket 2066 so that they can still say that they're the performance king. Now, I don't know, I have not run benchmarks or testing or anything like that on this particular platform. This is just my suspicion. Now, yes, 
This might keep them on top in single thread performance. And to some people, that's very important. But we must ask, at what cost? <laughs> at the cost of the onboard video. At the cost of an X299 motherboard that's going to be very expensive. At the cost of that giant CPU that has to be cooled, that can't be air cooled. It's, it's gonna be very costly to run one of these chips. When Z270 could still give you that single thread performance, yeah. Why X299? Why must you have KB Lake? Yeah, and it's just, it, it's got, it turns into, it's just a PR move. It's the only reason that we can think of is that it is literally a PR move because, you know, Skylake X maybe is not going to overclock as well. If you look at some of the new technology in X99, it's called Max Turbo Boost 3.0, this will give you um, two cores that will clock even higher than the turbo speed. So you see the, you see the tar charts and tables of CPUs and it'll say, Oh, the 10 core will turbo up to 4.3, but you get the max turbo 3.0 of 4.5, meaning two of the cores on that CPU will run at 4.5. And these are tricks that, that are, Intel is introducing to try to make up some of the ground of that single thread performance so that if you are running you know, a MOBA or you are, are running one of these games, that you still get the single thread performance even though you have a six, eight, 10, 12, 18 core CPU or whatever. And you're not going to get that with KB Lake X. You're not going to get anything new with KB Lake X. You're going to get the same old part that's probably going to get the five gigahertz and probably going to have great single thread performance. And that seems to be the only reason that it exists. Yep. Now talking to the overclockers at the event, you know, the overclockers were reporting pretty good success overclocking both KB Lake X and Sky Lake X. But, you know, surprisingly, looking at some of the D-Lid events and some of the other you know, sort of CPU teardowns. Um, none of these CPUs are soldered. This is the first time that the high-end, you know, enthusiast socket CPUs don't actually use solder um, to, you know, affix the, the integrated heat spreader to the CPU itself. So that's kind of surprising given that this, these CPUs are $1,000, $2,000 at the, the very top end. Um, but, you know, they were saying that the overclockability was actually pretty good on both Skylake X and KB Lake. But again, cherry picked CPUs and a whole bunch of whole bunch of other stuff we don't know yet because it's not out yet. We'll have to check back on this in about a month and see how right we were. The overclockers themselves also do not have 14, 16, and 18. As far as we know, nobody does. Yeah. So they're talking about the lower end stuff. Yeah, yeah. The uh, 14, 16, 18 uh, was very likely a reaction to AMD because it looked like only the 12 core part uh, and under it was really what had been prepared. So, you know, that, and that makes sense. That tracks, you know, last year, it's like we got the 10 core part. He was like the eight core was the previous flagship. Then it was the 10 core. Now the 12 core part will be the flagship. But even beyond that, you know, we've got the, the 14, 16 and 18 core parts going all the way up to $2,000 now. So that's Intel. Uh, we wondered how would Intel respond? Would they lower their prices or would they up their game? And they seem to have chosen the latter. <laughs> uh, it's still to be told whether or not they can actually do it, whether they can hit the performance marks. But so far, it does seem like everybody's winning in the red versus blue battle, <laughs> except, for, except for Intel. <laughs> I just, I mean, KB Lake X, even with four cores, it might make sense if you got the PCI Express lanes. Uh, for performance or whatever. It might make sense if you got quad channel memory, but since you don't have quad channel memory and you don't have the PCI Express lanes, I don't think that it makes any sense at all. The only explanation that I can come up with is that Intel needed to do that for the people that are only interested in single thread or performance in a few thread, which is basically down to games. It's also important to note that when you talk about PCI Express lanes, that is the one area where Intel doesn't win anywhere because Everything Threadripper is going to have 64. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, 58, 64, depending on how you count. And, uh, you know, even Ryzen 7 is 16 plus 4 plus 4 on their PCI Express configuration. So you've, you're in a better situation uh, even on the Ryzen AM4 platform. But really, looking at Threadripper and seeing how Threadripper stacks up, that's X399 on AMD, stacks up to X299 versus AM4 versus Z270, it's a much better landscape than trying to have AM4, you know, AM4 kind of sort of versus stuff on X99 because AM4 doesn't have as many PCI Express lanes as X99. But now we're in a situation where 
and we've got Ryzen 7 on AM4. And I bet you that we have low, relatively low core count stuff on um, AMD's X399 platform. So probably like eight, 10 core parts that are much less expensive than the 16 core part. So if you are a person who does not benefit from more than eight or 10 cores, but you would benefit from lots of PCI Express lanes, I'm pretty sure AMD's gonna have a part for you. Now the Skylake X is impressive, very impressive numbers and they are the winner, but one problem is 14, 16 to 18, the parts that are outdoing AMD, no one's seen them. Uh, they might, might exist. Aware. Might be out in 2018. Maybe not. We yeah, we've got a, a long way to go to wait for those. <laughs> but you did see some things. So just what what actually is tangible? What can we depend on that you have seen about <laughs> X299? Well, we did a full video on the MSI X299 motherboards because MSI sent us to Computex. We also looked, uh, we, we took a quick look at um, X299 from ASRock, ASUS, and Gigabyte. Um, the, the boards honestly looked, you know, very similar across the board, very similar LAN configurations, very similar, you know, options, RGB, no RGB, that kind of thing. ASRock had an ITX X299 system. This was using a notebook DDR4 memory. So it was a quad channel solution unlike their previous ITX system, which was, you know, only two channels out of four. Uh, it was expandable. It had an M.2. It had like little daughter riser cards for SATA. It looked like a pretty interesting board. Saw Tai Chi versions of the uh, the X299 uh, system from them as well. Gigabyte had a bunch of interesting boards for X299. They had everything from, you know, basically a gaming three version of X299 all the way up through, you know, one with a built-in um, custom loop water cooler block if you wanted to use that for cooling your, your chipset. Again, very similar M.2 and motherboard configurations, dual LAN configurations. Um, a Quantia 10 gigabit NICs on most motherboards, depending on, you know, not at the low end, but at the higher end. So 10 gigabit was a, was a pretty consistent feature of the higher end X299 boards. So that was really exciting. Um, Asus had obviously put a lot of work into their boards. They had a really killer aesthetic going for them, you know, sort of understated RGB. Also had one that had an OLED display that was programmable. So if you wanted to go really nuts and have a display on your motherboard that is a little bit more than an LED read readout and that is customizable, then Asus had you covered there. So uh, it's obvious that we're pretty late in the engineering stages for these motherboards. So I think X299 availability uh, you know, it's, it is rushed, they say, but the hardware side of it feels like it's a lot farther along um, than I would expect of something that is described as rushed. So, did they give you any idea about the pricing for these boards? They sound pretty beefy. Yeah, the boards honestly looked really complicated and they would not commit, no one would really commit to, uh, you know, final US retail pricing. So I get, I get the idea that there's some flexibility there with what those are gonna be, but I would guess, you know, three to $500 typically for, for, for these kinds of boards, just because the bill of materials cost is insanely high on these boards. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have a budget board for a $1,000 to $2,000 CPU. Yeah. All right, so we've wasted enough of your time because most of you care about one thing, and that's our opinion, which is better, red versus blue. <laughs> it's too early to tell. I don't, I don't, it's, it's, uh, it does not look like Intel is winning on the value proposition. I've, I've got to yeah. say that. I think really value doesn't. means more than it ever has. With the whole Ryzen 7, Ryzen 5, value meant a lot, but value means even more here because these prices are insane. It really is. And you know, if this is your livelihood, if you're the type of person who legitimately would need a $2,000 CPU for your livelihood, not just for entertainment, I would hope, then, you know, there are some things that this platform leaves to be desired, not the least of which is error correcting memory. Um, you know, in terms of red versus blue, it looks like you're going to get that on, you know, from AMD, you know, on the high end desktop platform, certainly on the server platform. Uh, these are things that are typically relegated to Xeon workstation. The, the, the line here between these overclockable enthusiast machines and a Xeon based workstation, it's other than like a little bit of overclockability, it's getting really hard for me to tell the difference because it used to be that the i7 was a lot cheaper than a Xeon. So unless Xeons are gonna get a lot more expensive, how that, that line's basically gone. I think a good analogy is a drag racing car, right? Yes, Intel has come out with something that outperforms the competition 
but railroads have curves and <laughs> you need to get more than one mile per gallon. So, you know, it's great, but who needs it? <laughs> the, the 10 core part or the eight core part might be viable in some scenarios, uh, but it's still, it's a, it's a really high cost. Time will tell. But this is where we are with X299. The motherboards are very late in the manufacturing process and in the development process. So they're basically hitting retailers as we speak. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see how this shakes out. I hope I can get my hands on some X299 parts to mess around with and to run some benchmarks and to get some more performance data and see how the cache rebalancing stacks up and see how the performance really is in, in real world. See if our, some of our predictions line up, but you know, time will tell. So now that we've drawn out these battle lines and told you what we think about the Intel lineup, uh, go ahead and put on your red or blue cape, whichever you prefer, and begin shit posting furiously in the comment section below. Mm, begun the core wars have. <laughs> if you want to see more content like this, please click on the uh, MSI Dragon Squad link in the description. Scroll down and uh, find the level one content in the list like this. Click on it and then click heart to vote for it. So if you've been asleep in the video up to this point, you know, what do you need to know? It's like, well, KB Lake X by decree of level one shall henceforth be known as Intel Covfefe Lake, or if you prefer Intel Wallet Ripper. <laughs>